officials of government, all officials of government here, the Council of Chiefs and Elders, other dignitaries, members of the press, fellow Nigerians, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Mr. President, I and my family extend to you our profoundest gratitude for my preferment to deliver the 171st Independence Day Oration. Men far more gifted in the business of speech have for decades performed this ritual. And we chose him to deliver this oration on this defining moment of national rediscovery. It's truly an honor for which I will forever remain indebted. We gathered here today, nearly six months after the inauguration of the new president. We are charged with the responsibility to change that which has defied our beloved country for nearly a century and a quarter. The president, I do not envy the awesomeness and difficulty of the challenge you are inherited. The 24 men and a woman have occupied the Liberian presidency. What is proven? That we as a country have not been able to. In social and economic justice to the majority of all of our people. This difficult task now rests squarely, fully, on the shoulders of the government. On the eve of these celebrations, some of our compatriots have even questioned the value of holding these ceremonies. The majority of our people remain jobless, but when our economy is challenged, those calling for cancellation of TX have reasonable arguments. Maybe not celebrating July 26 sends a louder, a bigger message that the Liberian people want something different from their government, and that their government today cannot be business as usual. Maybe they are right. But there is a louder message for not holding these celebrations. If we didn't hold these celebrations, we as a people would be succumbing to our fears, our worst fears. We would be giving up on the ideas that inspired our country's founding. We would be showing that we are less than the sum of our fears. We are stronger and braver as a people. <laughs> Mr. President, my fellow citizens, those who founded this country were men and women of our vision. If we lose faith in the capacity, capability, and possibilities of our government, if we turn to despair and fear, if we condemn ourselves to the repetition of historical tragedies that have defied us for ages, we would have betrayed the drive, ambition, and sacrifice that our founding fathers be free to us 171 years ago. This is why, Mr. President, I have chosen to speak to my fellow compatriots on the subject, renewing that ambition that drove our nation's founding. Yes. The men and women who founded this country were made of ambition. They left the scourge of slavery to establish for themselves a society in which all would be free and equal. The dangerous journeys across the Atlantic did not scare them. The outbreak of disease like malaria did not know them. And the fierce and battle hardened resistance from bands of brave farmer warriors did not prevent them. The ambition of building a new, a just, a free society remained the towering idea. These invading settlers were men that are patriotic, battle warriors, far more fearless and even braver in the defense of the native lands and tribal customs. Armed with indigenous and primitive weapons, they faced the guns and cannons of invading settlers, who were sometimes backed by the superior weapons of naval forces of the United States and Great Britain. These tribal warriors preferred death to surrendering their lands 
Today, we Nigerians inherit their valor. We inherit their bravery and ambition. We are brave because of them. July 4th is a celebration of their matter law. We should never forget about the heroes of these times because we face challenges in our own time. I saw my fellow professors, our founding fathers, both settlers and tribal leaders, to many battles and prolonged rounds of diplomacy, inspired by men like King Sarboso Kabalak, that first two Nigerian diplomats. Our fathers were able to proclaim the word on July 26, 1847, the birth of the new republic. This proclamation is not important merely because it was the establishment of a new country. No. This proclamation is all the more significant because our declaration of independence occurred when the capacity of black peoples for self government was in doubt in Europe and America. Black people were still perceived as less than humans, enslaved to the farms and public fields. This is why our national anthem says, We shout that the freedom of a race be united. The Oxford Dictionary defines united as being in a state of contemptible intellectual or moral ignorance. At our founding, this was the perception of the black race. And it was not just the current state of humanism. Our family centers broke out in the conjoined, the conjoined forces with their little brothers and sisters to proclaim the beginnings of our beloved country. So this is our family, for which we shall forever remain proud. We are a people in endless search of the mastery of our destiny. The goal of our history is to give justice and equality to all our people. Mortal and highly flawed men and women will mount the political stage to pursue these ideals of our founding from time to time. We should separate the of the national search from the ideal itself. It is true that men and women who have historically steered our national cause have betrayed the founding ideal. And over the years, we have wasted these men with criticism. Because of their failures, we have always looked upon our past with disdain. Some Nigerians would like to erase from the memory any recollection of that tragic history of our past and pretend that we have started a country afresh and anew. These feelings of anger, hatred, and rejection are quite justified. The mass of our people should never have been denied education for fear that their education would pose a threat to a governing elite who were in a minority. The two way budget clearly had the means to build more than 3,000 kilometers of road paved roads for the duration of its stay at the time of national leadership. The two way budget was certainly in the position to diversify our economy and build a thriving private sector in which Nigerians would have, the, would have been the titans of domestic production, winning us away from our dependence on the export of raw materials. So Nigerians are justified in their perennial criticism and anger. The same is true of the People's Redemption Council and the National Democratic Party of Nigeria followed the PRC during the 1980s. The abuse of human rights and the wanton misuse of the country's resources that characterized the 1980s were neither problems of our civil company. And of course, those who came to protect the wrongs of the 1980s committed even more heinous and unconscionable wrongs that today haunt and burden our national psyche. So we can spend countless hours and pages bemoaning the lost opportunities of our history. Such an exercise is more useful when we are able to glean from the past the valuable lessons that can enable us to avoid the history of thoughts. My fellow countrymen, the failure of history is not defined by the number of tragedies that happen. cannot inspire new energies, new ambition, new constructs and institutions that prevent the calamities of our history from reoccurring. <laughs> our history fails not because American Nigerians suppressed the affected brothers and sisters for more than a century. Our history fails because even decades after the fall of the Tuway Party, Vast of Liberians still feel marginalized in their own country. And 
And I fast forward where two men and a woman are found in Liberian presidency. And when different national legislatures are being dominated by ethnic Liberians. <laughs> Our hands are filled, not because we rise up from April, the rise in April 14, 1979. Our history feels because 39 years after President Obama and our father Jane tried to increase the price of rice to protect the rest of rice production, we still are not able to feed ourselves and our children depending on the food of rice. And so, my fellow Nigerians, as we follow the historical significance of the day and look back to our past, coming out of these reflections should be a new narrative. And I would say not merely a way of condemnation of the things that are going wrong in our country. We should frame a new narrative of an ambitious people, restlessly renewing that ambition passed on to them by their founding fathers to perfect their views of history. Our history is rich with stories of bravery, daring, and ambition that should inspire all of us with new energies and momentum to face our future. Those who found that they were set out in the dark, bleak, and perilous course. All they had was the power of their conviction and the size of their national ambition. There were settlers who landed on the shores of Montreal, but who fled back because of the difficult conditions they encountered. The scores of Allegra took its toll upon them, but many they fled more because they feared the battle hands of one time warriors. Those who fled are the cowards of our history, the men and women who will never do it out. Today, we read on Elijah Johnson and Jehuda Ashley. We talk about King Zoe Kuma, and as skillful diplomat King Sarboso Kamara, whose diplomacy is going to rise the settlers and exist in Bali, Gola, Day, and the Indian warriors through the pinnacles of our country's power. We know about these heroes. We also read about Chief Swakogo, whose diplomacy, selflessness, and leadership enabled the expansion of Liberian government authority in northwest areas of Bong, Lofa, and Lima. There's also Paramount Chief Noah Lemon. Female Colonel Chief of the Fire Chief Dunn in Bond County. A lack of formal education proved no hindrance for effective political leadership. She's widely remembered for promoting women participation in decision making, chief of schools, clinics, and roads. So the broad courage, selflessness, daring, and official comes to the beginnings of our national cause. We see these traits in countless ordinary citizens. Imagine our mothers and sisters who brave the storms of poverty every day, selling for long, long hours on the market stalls and many times under the special rays of the sun to support their families. Deprived of education, they work hard to farming or selling daily to give education to their children. The education and progress of men and women of our generation did not happen because of the Nigerian government. That education happened because of our own son, mothers, and grandmothers. Carried difficult decisions to leave school to advance his football career in Cameroon. 
Very young. They were taken as far as the United States. A time when many of the girls, many of the girls were so sure black in the US. Many of us asked them to make these decisions. But the way they found it is not the job. Eventually, the federal government broke through the national standard. The staff who promised the Europe was subsequently paid. When he went out to become the greatest African footballer the world had ever seen, winning the world has been the The finest football achievement, George Bell remained humble and true to his beginnings. The same selflessness displayed by Chief Swagogo and Chief Noah Lundi. He spread his fortune on the Liberian national team and on his fellow countrymen, supporting schools, building charity and communities, and sponsoring countless number of students. During the dark days of the Liberian civil conflict, when blood spattered from beneath the land, George Bell and Charlie Starr beckoned the possibility of a new Liberian future amid the bleak darkness of the land. It was these attributes that endeared him the most the patriots of the new generation of political ideologues and scholars who organized themselves under the banner of the Congress of Democratic Change to project George Bellamia as that mobilizing dynamic of a society in search of national transformation. <laughs> His contributions to the Liberian political landscape have been legendary. Today, he is seated in these hollow halls as President of the Republic. I salute you, son. Please permit me to join you in that inspired search for national meaning and healing. George Bell's achievements and the achievements of many other Liberians stand as a monument to the power and possibilities of Liberian dreams and ambition. The daring and ambition inherent in our family exemplified themselves in many ways in our society. We should go to these for inspiration. Today, we stand at the crossroads that defines two paths in the power path of our history. A path that sinks into the politics of hate, blame, and division, and a path that looks to the future of possibilities for all Liberians. The first path, the first path is widely travel because it's easy. So it only requires the lazy art of condemnation and blaming. The second path is less tribal because it is too difficult. Requiring people of ambition and national pride, determined to forge the cause of unity as we face the problems of our society. So which path should we as a people choose? Our only choice is others. As a result of 2017 presidential elections, Nigerians have chosen the path that is less tribal. In those elections, they have rejected the politics of fear in favor of the politics of hope. Hope that a country can renew its founding ambition to overcome the big historical challenges that have come from the day for decades. It is in this spirit of unity and renewed national purpose that we are able to face our worst fears and biggest problems. No problem in Liberia is bigger than, than the problem of corruption. Corruption has been the root cause of the conflicts that have run through our history. This generation of Liberians and this new government was renewed its pledge to fight and end corruption. <laughs> the first step toward this goal is to abolish the culture of impunity that has surrounded the misuse of public policy. This means we have to give more deep and meaning to anti corruption institutions like the General Audit Commission the Liberian Anti-Corruption Commission, and the Internal Audit Agency. These institutions are the watchdogs that ensure we spend public resources for the benefit of all our people. Our new president has promised that under his leadership, those who misuse public funds will have no place in his government. Such persons must face the full weight of the law. This is certainly reassuring to all our countrymen and our development partners who will provide, provide important resources for our national development. Many Liberians have demanded an audit of the previous government as well as the prosecution of formal officials of government accused of slavery public funds. Toward this end, the new government must conduct a review of all audit reports with a view to implementing many of the recommendations contained in them. <laughs> the government of President George Biak has committed to conducting this review, and this is encouraging. Whether the present government should spend scarce human and financial resources on going after former government or, or 
when the government should, that government should focus on the big economic problems that burn our people is an interesting choice that must be made. It is very obvious that investing resources in preventing new acts of corruption and in the economic transformation of our country should be prepared. First, this approach minimizes the new government's exposure to accusations of breach of it. To the search, to the extent that evidence of such corrupt acts exists, delaying these prosecutions does not prevent the demanding prosecution from happening at some time in the future. Second, a focus on past acts of corruption may be one means for restoring public faith in the credibility and possibility of our government. Another means is to use scarce public resources more effectively and efficiently to raise the living standards of our people. The new government has already begun to use this type of approach. The government has added more than 2,000 healthcare workers to the national payroll for the purpose of the national government. This was possible because of the strong cooperation between the president and the national legislature, led by House Speaker Bobble Chambers and President of the Temporary Albert Chief. The collaboration that will be required to resolve even legal problems and challenges that lie ahead. The meaning of this achievement is that financial resources in question can now have been committed to providing the income for 2,000 Liberian families. And these resources are no longer available to be abused, misused, or wasted. The government president of Guyana has to make his decision because they have to move on. He has to make this decision because they have to move on, which has been supported by some of our development partners for the last several years is no longer available. And the government has, has, has placed these workers on the payroll at a time when our economy and fiscal space are challenged. The best time to have done this was six years ago, when the government was in a stronger financial position. But where the, where the last government didn't achieve this, the present government has achieved it. This is an example of how we correct the facts. We not only condemn that which was not achieved by past generations or past governments, we build on the gains they made and fix the problems that, we, that they were not able to fix. is the diversification of the Liberian economy. The Liberian economy has historically depended on the sale of raw materials like iron ore and rubber. This is not sustainable. Such dependence exposes the Liberian economy to massive economic shocks. In 2009, the price of iron ore per dry metric ton was US $181. Today, that price is around US $60 to $70. Single price declines have affected the wrong sector. These price crashes have imposed severe economic squeeze on Liberians, decreasing government's ability to earn foreign exchange and putting down the pressure on the Liberian government. But these developments come as no surprise. More than 200 years of economic history show that commodity prices will always collapse. Despite this knowledge and history, the economies of African countries have always been tied to the price of exported raw materials. African governments have themselves to blame for this failure to diversify. In the end, it is sovereign states that are responsible for the ultimate direction of their societies. As commodity prices have collapsed over the last 60 or more years, African countries have always looked to the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the African Development Bank, the European Union for support as well as other factors to build them out of the shock until price recovers. Our countries will have to break out of this vicious market <laughs> yeah. All previous governments in Liberia have failed to unlock our economy from its historic dependence on commodity prices. This generation and this government must address the problem. Today, the depreciation of the Liberian dollar is rising and rising inflation can be trade to this failure of the diverse society. A few politicians still smarting from defeat in the 2017 elections have recently tried to politicize what is a fundamental structural economic problem. And this is, very, this, this is the very kind of politics that has destroyed our country. It's a structural politics that has no place in the new national dispensation. 
The six month old government cannot play, can clearly not be expected to solve a problem most African governments have not been able to solve in 60 years. And to believe that Liberians, as smart as they are, can be misled into thinking that a six month old government should solve a 60 year old problem in six months is to think too low about Liberians. Our people know better than this, and they cannot be and should not be misled. In the last election, Liberia supported this, this president because they believe that he stands the greatest chance to change what has challenged us for generations. The government remains committed to stabilizing the present macroeconomic situation. The government, as recently announced in an economic speech by the president, has already begun putting in motion short term measures to stabilize the situation. These measures include the infusion of US 25 million into the market to help access liquidity. Other measures involve the more aggressive enforcement of monetary policy. While the loss of about US 500 million in the Liberian dollar is the main driver of the depreciation of the Liberian dollar, currency speculation in the foreign exchange market is partly to blame. The Central Bank of Liberia is developing other instruments to reduce the supply of money outside banks. Large amounts of money are outside banks, monetary policy can be weak and built up by President Obiak. This has to be the case, this has been the case for the last two to three years. The steps the government has taken are in the right direction. The government is also taking strong measures to ensure any appreciation of the Liberian dollar as a result of these measures is reflected in the price of commodities. Recently, major petroleum commodities agreed to reduce their price by US 14 cents per gallon, as announced by President Biden. This should impact household fares, which should go down in the coming days. As part of this measure to reduce the burden of Liberians, the government recently reduced the input of several commodities. This reduction is estimated to cost the government about 14 to 20 million dollars in lost revenue. But this is a sacrifice that this government is prepared to make to bring short-term relief to the majority of the Again, all of these are intended to stabilize our macroeconomic in the short term to move toward long-term solutions. The government in the next several weeks will launch this program for agenda for prosperity and development. All stakeholders are pressing making their final input into the plan. The agenda provides a roadmap for addressing Liberia's long-term structural economic problems. The plan will bring all actors in the Liberian government together to address the problem of value addition and expansion of the private sector. The plan looks to invest in road infrastructure, aiming to pay more than 1,000 kilometers of road, which is about the length of road that has been paid in the past 171 years. The plan will transform agriculture as we know it and push the boundaries of domestic production far beyond the possibilities of the last several decades. Today, we import about 26 million bags of rice every year at a cost of about USD 110 million. Assuming a population of 4 million rice eating Liberians, this amounts to about 6 bags of rice per person per year. We can grow this rice in Liberia. According to the experts, we have more than 600,000 hectares of land conducive for rice production. Studies show that with the right investment and development of rice value chains, we can achieve food security over the next 10 years. This is one of the biggest solutions of the pro agenda for prosperity, and one of the biggest ambitions of the agenda. But to achieve this goal, we require Liberians to begin shifting their diet toward locally grown food and their preferences for locally manufactured products. The government will partner with the private sector and development partners to develop agricultural value chains in rice, cassava, vegetable, planting. In 1979, William Howard Thomas Jr. attempted to increase the price on imported rice to protect domestic rice production. Politicians used this to incite demonstration. A huge part of increasing the price on imported rice so that his domestic rice ventures could profit from the increase. Granted, this was true. Had this been possible, 
that I've given you come up there with my benefit. The capacity to go right, the last people would have been invested there with my dividends, and the money is generated from this production would have been put into the economy. Instead, what has emerged from this paper 14 episode is the improvement of imported rice as some kind of political commodity whose importation is largely in the hands of non Nigerians, largely because companies in the past have been able to This generation and this government must input this establish the myth that imported rice is political commodity and who is swiftly to scale up investment in domestic rice and food production. The government should work with these stakeholders in the private sector and development partners to achieve this outcome because it makes both macroeconomic sense and food security sense. Prior to the 1940s, the importation of rice was banned in Liberia. So we know Liberians have not always been for imported rice. Once the means of transformative production and a show in the domestic market becomes competitive, the optimal economic policy would be to raise the tariff on imported rice to protect the domestic rice market. Under such a policy, rice importers would have the incentive to invest their money and resources into growing rice here. Where the cash crop agricultural space, serious investments are needed to enable growers to add value to their products. Many of my very problem growers today face the acute challenge of paying their workers because of the very uncompetitive nature of the current pricing structure. These growers need to add value, but doing so requires some capital investment, which is difficult to come back. The government is committed to working on this with them. My fellow Nigerians, Mr. President, this brings us to the next big challenge that we have to solve over the next six years and the decades ahead. Developing Nigerian human capital. Human capital development underpins our country's transformation. The nation is fully as good as the quality of its human and institutional capabilities. The quality of, this, of our teachers, doctors, and engineers will have to change radically over the next seven years. The number of substandard teachers providing instruction in schools is too large. But attracting high quality teachers has serious cost complications. The 2018 2019 budget has absorbed some 2,000 healthcare workers. The fiscal space to take on 6,000 new teachers that have made the close what has been called the teaching gap is not there. In the short term, taking on these teachers is possible with improvements in revenue performance and with further rationalization of the national budget. I would propose. The government launched a national service scheme to attract qualified college graduates to teaching fees to address the quality challenge in secondary education. <laughs> and we have education we already have a program to attract a small number of these college folks. We just have to blow this up. These graduates should be deployed in the most deprived areas in terms of benefits such as scholarship for advanced degrees in low cost countries. It is also important to overhaul the whole structure and foundation of government scholarship. Linking scholarship to national service. As a matter of fact, students placing first at private and public high schools and at universities in this country should at least be given priority preference during their award of scholarship or of recruitment in the civil service. This approach provides some incentive for students to study private. Scholarships should be for scholars, whether to burn the midnight oil. We yeah. all teach our students to work hard and strive for excellence. There's a need to launch a national after school program that can focus on a range of subjects. These programs can compete with centers of gambling and gaming that now attract our young people from productive focus on their students. The government, development partners, and non governmental organizations should work together to develop and sustain such a program. We should work to strengthen quality in college and university education. Quality challenges at higher institutions could be addressed by reintroducing the pre war Fulbright program that existed at the University of Liberia, or some version of that program. India, for example, has competitive advantage in the supply of quality education. Indian professors could be brought 
in the show of better performances, tools, as well as math, computer technology, and belongs to the as kid brought and family university. This can be done at a further cost as a package of all the reforms of virtual education. In exchange, I will instruct you that these universities can be given scholarships to pursue advanced degrees. The government should continue to focus on the delivery of TVET. Partnership with German technical vocational institutions can improve the quality of institution at TVET, of instruction at TVET institutions across the country to enable the country to provide skills and jobs for our young people. Unless Liberia is able to provide competitive skills for the majority of these young people, we face a national security risk arising from the failure to meet the important needs of our young people. Few possibilities lie in the agricultural space, where the majority of young people can find gainful employment as we move the sector toward value addition. While we acknowledge many young people may lack skills, we also know that many of them have been an some form of training. Despite this outcome, young people remain challenged. The government is advised to develop a policy that links every ongoing project in the country with existing TV-led institutions. Such a policy can require project managers on, on these projects to hire at least one Nigerian group trained in a relevant or religious skilled area. As part of this youth employment drive, the government and the other partners should increase their support the program supports the employment and employability of our young brothers and sisters. The excuse that young people do not have the skills should not be blindly accepted. We see the beginnings of the emergence of the young Nigerian entrepreneurial class. Many of the schools and businesses in Ganga, today in Hima County, are owned by young Nigerians. Nigerians are looking into the private sector as a major source of employment. All they need is a big push from their government. They will have this push from this government and from what they have. A major way to enhance the youth development agenda is to pay attention to what is happening to our young women. The challenge we face is even more significant and has direct causal linkages to poverty. The average young girl who drops out of school will go on to have a child that is more than likely to be poor. There are many gentle indicators that we can talk about over the next several years. If we cannot achieve any of them, our society must ensure that we prevent young women from dropping out of school and from getting pregnant while we stay in the The other historically unsolved problem is the main challenge. Many disputes have been and are still right in our country. Communities are still not in disputes with agricultural concessions on the question of land ownership. We should address this problem and we should do so fast. The passage of the new land act will be promising, is a promising beginning, but we cannot rest on the laurels of any such new law. We must reach out to all our people throughout the country to drive home the importance of land for economic productivity. Agriculture concessions need all the land they can have to scale up their investment and provide the needed jobs to support our economy. If we have to do value addition in the oil palm sector, for example, the companies will have to plant more trees, and this is not possible when they do not have land. Yes, the awarding of these contracts was struck with problems, but this is where we are. Maybe part of the problem is that our people do not trust that the proceeds of these investments will matter for them at all. These are the consequences of the prolonged neglect and marginalization of our people. This new government must reach out to develop a compact with our people and assure them that these concessions are for their ultimate benefit. Members of the national legislature can play an important role in this transformation. It is very clear that considering the state of our economy and the fiscal constraints we face, no government, including the present government, will be able to solve all of the problems that have burdened the bureau over the past 171 years. Each problem demands a certain amount of resources that will not be available to solve all problems. Using loans and budget support grants for road construction means these resources are no longer available to support programs in health, education, or agriculture. This is the complex business of government, which is always about choosing and prioritizing. And this business is even more complex than the country called Nigeria. In health, should we put more resources in prevention to reduce the disease burden? 
of the future, but we continue with an emphasis on curing diseases. In education, should we prioritize math, science, and language teachers more than these are the foundation of subjects? The societies and economies that are transformed in the face of resource constraints are those that are master of the art of balancing the development of priorities. Mr. President and my fellow government, Liberia was not able to meet any of the Millennium Development Goals in the last 18 years from 2000 to 2015. While the country did appear to be on a solid path to economic growth, nearly 9% around 2015, the market economic collapse that followed, along with the onset of Ebola, eliminated whatever gains that have been made. This again makes the point for diversifying our economy. If we have to avoid the same situation with the Sustainable Development Goals, we have to pay attention to address the big challenge of value addition. If we collectively confront the menace of corruption and ensure that scarce development resources are spent on the majority of our people, we will make a big difference in the impact of the lives of Nigerians. The fight against corruption should not be limited to regional government circles. It should be prominent in schools, clinics, in traffic, and in places of worship. Teachers who are stuck are the students who are better in the of the classroom. If we diversify our economy, empower the private sector, and resolve our land challenge, we will place our economy on a short path of sustainable development. Concerning our very vulnerable economic situation, our strategic approach to growing the private sector should bring all stakeholders around the table. The private sector comprises foreign-owned companies and Nigerian-owned businesses. Pro-Liberian business strategies need not imply opposition to foreign business interests. In our rush to keep economic to diversify our economy, we should not scare away those who have sustained the foundation of our economy even before we have the ability to trust in the United States. Members of the executive and executive branches of government, I encourage the prime minister to work with companies in Liberia as we diversify our economy. Inflammatory and violent rhetoric may threaten the short term foundation of the Nigerian economy. Pro war economic strategies are not anti business strategies, and President Weir has made this point in the past. But businesses are expected to play by the rules and pay their fair share of the bargain. For example, when government produces tariff on commodities, consumers expect to see this reflected in the price of the affected product. These outcomes should be achieved by aggressive enforcement to ensure that businesses get their fair share in profits and consumers do not receive the worst end of the bargain in the form of higher prices. The economic policies that will come out of the new development plan will aim to provide strong incentives to move the Liberian economy toward competitive domestic production. I believe many people who are entrepreneurs will respond to these incentives to make the necessary investments in domestic production. In the near short term, this government should use the power of the national budget to empower those most productive sectors to buy local policies. The seriousness of this policy should attract investment in sectors such as agriculture and the timber and rural areas. It is worth noting that many of these policies were announced by the previous government. The difference now is that we as a people and a government will have to make it happen over the next seven years. But we cannot do these things alone, considering the difficult solutions that the challenges we face. This is where we have to run turn to our bilateral and international development partners to recast our relations with them in the context of diversifying our economy and empowering the private sector. Our development partners have stood with Liberia over the years and we should thank them massively for raising my bearer from the arches of the ball and taking on the path to development. <laughs> the government has promised to develop a new partnership framework with development partners. The aim of this partnership framework should be to ensure that the big priority challenges that the country faces are addressed in order to achieve real political results. One area of particular interest is working together to reverse recent declines in the business climate, as measured through the World Bank's Small Business Index. Improving Liberia's ranking can be accomplished through a dedicated tax team comprising actors from the private sector. Strengthening development partnership and coordination can deliver big results for economic transformation and macroeconomic stability. 
when the outcome of this work version were challenged in the past, the approach going forward should be to make it work now. Political parties and politicians do have a role, a very serious role, to minimize the politics of pettiness that aims to score trivial political points. There are many no points to score against the problem that is barely six months old. The election cycle is six years long. The politics of market economics can be dangerous for political stability. We already know this from people from the history. Aiming to raise the political temperature against the party that is grounded in the masses is not a good end politics. The cooling force is that which was produced by Ambassador George Malone after his loss in the 2011 election. With the massive Liberians supported behind him, George Kerry has exploited his populism and popularity to undermine the Liberian state and the government of President Eddie Johnson Sunil. Quite to the contrary, he took the patriotic path in the narrative of the opposition policy of constructive engagement. This was why he accepted to become the National Peace Ambassador, working full time to unify his country. Evidence of the Congress of Democratic Change were involved in a radical end step down campaign some years ago. It was George Bia who abolished that campaign, arguing that elections have consequences and people elected to be there in the Chinese government. <laughs> Members of the opposition are advised to take similar posts because in reality the elections are not over and governance has begun. Elections are the fight for political legitimacy in matters of governance. The conferral of legitimacy after an electoral victory does not mean the loser is hopeless. No winning party has a monopoly on ideas in the matters of public governance. The opposition has and should be invited to bring their perspectives for the betterment of our country. They are encouraged to bring their investment in their projects for the transformation of Liberia. In the spirit of overcoming our historic challenges and building a new, we will begin with a government opposition dialogue in the next coming days. Let us all abandon the politics of bewitching our country evil because we are not in power. Mm -hmm. Let us all abandon the politics of bewitching our country evil because we are out of political power. This is the whole politics that drains the blood of our country. Yes. And personally, we are made it quite quite decently. A governing party is only as good as the condition it inherits from a former ruling party. At least in the first six months. The, the CDC is only as good as the condition it inherited from the unity party in the first six months. Even the country giant, even this country giant cannot wave a magic wand that we stole market economic stability in six months. Members of the media too should get rid of the election. Mm -hmm. The media has an important role for the democracy and the government is under obligation to respect this role. Our country has made significant strides in the protection of this freedom and this tradition should and will continue. And I thank you, Madam, for giving all this advice. The so our media institutions have the responsibility to speak truth to political power. That truth must be true. <laughs> the persistent reporting of non truths is a great disservice to democracy and to our country. A disservice to democracy because the public will soon perceive such a newspaper or news outlet engaged in this party as a propaganda machinery set against the government. And when such a paper or media outlet is then needed to expose governmental wrongs when they do in fact occur, that paper will no longer be trusted, and this undermines the very process of journalism. Also, unfounded and untruthful media reporting is a disservice to the country because it is flat out wrong to mislead foreigners and others that are happening in our country. The entire country should not suffer because the journalist has a beef with a particular government official. As well as the president, and my fellow Liberians, our collective ambition to drive over the next several decades will determine what kind of we will have. The veteran Liberian journalist G. Henry Andrews once said that no society can ever be better than the people that comprise it. 
You show me a fearful, divided, and faithless people, I gave you a vanquished and defeated people. You show me a brave and courageous men, brave and courageous men and women fighting the title, national wave, and provision, bouncing the nation, long for long to go for destiny. I gave you a people called Liberians. We as a people were born to gain the possibilities of African self government. We were at the founding of the United Nations and the organization of African Unity, now African Union, and post that annual meeting in 1979. We are the founding of the African Development Bank. We inspired the formation of the Mount River Union and economic community of the African State. It was President William P.S. Stockman who proposed the economic union of West Africa. The beacon of black self government, we then battled alongside our, our black compatriots in South Africa to dismantle the gargoyle of apartheid. We were a heaven for peoples all over Africa, Sudanese, Ethiopians, Ghanaians, Ghanaians, and many more, even long before they opened their doors to our people, fleeing the collapse of our nation state. We are greater than the sum of our fears, and they put a look back at the scourges of our history, whose themes inspire the cries and shouts of freedom and change that will mark the next hundred years with the fundamentally radical difference than the last. May God Almighty bless our great country and our great people. University of Liberia 
and graduated with Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics and Mathematics in 2001, magnum cum laude. Later, you earned a master's degree in Economics from George Washington University in Washington, D.C., United States of America. Upon your return to Liberia, you worked as the lead economic consultant at the Ministry of Planning and Economic Affairs to cast the agenda for transformation undertaken by the government of President Ellis Johnson serving in 2011. Subsequently, you were hired as the economist of the National Millennium Compact Development Project, which enabled Liberia to receive the MCC grant that financed the rehabilitation of the Mount Coffee Hydro Electric Dam. Your dedication, loyalty, and unwavering commitment to service, particularly the high standard of excellence, enables you to serve as senior advisor to the executive director of the African Development Bank for the constituency comprising the Gambia, Ghana, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and uh, Sudan. Also, you have become known and credited for your passion and advocacy for Africa's development. You will be remembered as a true nationalist who remarkably exhibited competence intelligence, dignity, and respect at all levels of your service to the state of Liberia. Now, therefore, in consideration of your enormous contributions to the cause of humanity, especially for the economic development of Liberia, I, George Manenguia, President of the Republic of Liberia, by virtue of the authority in me invested as Grand Master of the Orders of Distinction of the Republic of Liberia, do hereby admit you, Samuel E. Puerto in the unique order of African redemption, and confer upon you the grave of my great man. Where is this seat there? with pride and dignity to the glory of God. Accept my congratulations. July 26, 
1918. You were born on November 29, 1949, in Montucan, Geodipo District, Sino County, Southeastern Liberia, under the union of Mr. and Mrs. John C. Winker. You earned your primary and junior high school education in Upper Geodipo section of Sino County and later moved to Monrovia where you completed your high school studies at the Assemblies of God Mission School in Monrovia. Responding favorably to the call of God on your life, you gained admission at the Assemblies of God Bible College and obtained a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology. Immediately after college, you embarked upon your full-time Christian ministry, serving in several capacities to include pastor, district secretary, and treasurer of the Monroe District Assemblies of God Mission spanning 20 years. You were very instrumental in planting the Assemblies of God Church in many areas. You were also privileged to serve as chairman of the Liberian Fellowship of Full Gospel Ministers for many years, during which time you led the Liberian delegation to the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire to mediate in the Liberian peace process. You also traveled extensively to many countries, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and participating in leadership seminars and conferences. In recognition, of your high impactful spiritual devotion, in 2006, you were cited and dual honorary doctor of divinity degrees were conferred on you by the International Theological Seminary of Vegas, Federal Republic of Nigeria. Wow, 2007, another degree was conferred on you by the International Christian University of Virginia, United States of America. You are the founder and president of the Isaac Winkler Global Ministries Incorporated Dominion Christian Fellowship Center and president of the Dominion School of Ministry. Additionally, you are, you are also the founder of the Dominion Christian Institute in Painesville City, Monrovia, Liberia. Your dedication to the mission of the church motivated the International Communion of Charismatic and Evangelical Bishops and Apostles in Coverage to enthrone you as Archbishop on March 31st, 2018 as the first Pentecostal full gospel charismatic archbishop in Liberia. You are an author credited for several publications including Wisdom for Divine Uplifting, The Power of Desire, and The Prophetic Prayer. Now therefore, in consideration of your enormous contribution to the cause of humanity, especially the people of Liberia. I, George Manin Weah, President of the Republic of Liberia, by virtue of the authority in being vested as Grand Master of the Orders of Distinction of the Republic of Liberia, do hereby admit you Archbishop Dr. Isaac Sam Winker, Senior, into the order of the Star of Africa and confer upon you the grade of Grand Band. Wear this insignia with pride and dignity to the glory of God. Accept my congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. 
You will be seated. Come on, 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 come on,
for the win, I see these other men to recall But all in all, peace and unity can make us sin until I be rest in peace Shout it loud, brother, shout it out M-I-T-E Oh, I'm a talent to
of the cabinet and minister of foreign affairs in the Lebanon, Milton Finley, who will deliver messages of solicitation from sovereign heads of state and government. Thank you. 